when it looks the darkest, and Good Friday is certainly the darkest day of all history, but note, but note the word. It's Good Friday. It's not Tragic Friday. It's not Sad Friday. It's not Dark Friday. Because when we look back on that time, when history looked the bleakest, it was just a prelude to that bright day of Easter Sunday. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the Twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands, and put my finger where the nails were, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. When Jesus appeared to the disciples, Thomas wasn't there. He missed out on it. And I meet many people who feel like that, as if it's, well, it's happened to other people, this faith thing, but it hasn't happened to them. Well, I think he did a sensible thing, that he was sceptical. He said, I want to see evidence. I want to investigate for myself. Jesus gave him the evidence, and he believed. And then Jesus said, blessed are those who have not seen but have believed. Now, that doesn't mean that he's saying we have to have blind faith. Because it then goes on to say that these things are written that you might believe. So all of us who are, in a sense, like Thomas, we weren't there 2,000 years ago, there is evidence that we can see. We can read it for ourselves, investigate for ourselves, and then I think we can make the same response. Two main areas of data to consider. One of them concerns the empty tomb, and the other concerns the experience of the disciples. And many attempts have been made that resolve or put forward a scheme that could explain away why the body wasn't produced, that they went to the wrong tomb or the body was stolen or whatever. Or people try and explain away the experience and say, well, they were hallucinating or they uh, had some other psychological experience. But of course, if you explain away one, you haven't explained away the other. You've got to find an answer that makes sense of the entire package. Different people try to explain away the empty tomb, and one theory that's popular today is that uh, Jesus didn't actually die, he simply fainted. It's sometimes called the apparent death theory or the swoon theory. Um, it only came about in the turn of the 19th century. Up until then, people were quite convinced that if someone went through that and then was left for three days in a tomb, they would be dead. Uh, but actually, today, some people say, well, oh, possibly he didn't really die. Uh, and we need to address that question and answer it for people. The biggest refutation of the uh, apparent death theory is that anybody in Jesus' sickly state should have died on the cross, didn't, should have died in the tomb, didn't, couldn't roll a stone away, no problem, dead, uh, walks to wherever the disciples are and feet that are pierced, holding the side, pale, uh, you know, hair caked with sweat and blood, and he holds his hand up and says, guys, I told you I would rise again from the dead. The problem with the swoon theory is that it backfires. The biggest problem is logical, not medical. And here's the logical problem. What is this man who is swooned? He's alive, but he's not raised. That's the key. He's alive, he's not raised. And if you're not raised, you've lost your proclamation. Some people try to explain away the resurrection appearances by saying, well, that perhaps they were hallucinations. Uh, I'm an ex-psychologist, and I, I'm aware that actually some people do hallucinate in certain circumstances, but they have a particular characteristic to them. They happen to individuals. They happen in familiar places at familiar times. Perhaps a wife's husband has died and she thinks she sees him on his regular bus route. And they're fleeting. It comes again. She would look and say, oh, no, and there he's gone. How different it is with the appearances of Jesus. Uh, Jesus appeared to groups of people. 
it was unfamiliar places, unfamiliar times. And most of all, they weren't fleeting. He walked with them. He, he talked with them. He ate a meal with them. I don't think there's any way that we can say that these are hallucinations. When talking about the evidence for the resurrection, some people are just amazed that after 2,000 years there can be anything to discuss because they somehow believe that the more time elapses, the less the evidence is valid. Um, but of course, if the evidence 2,000 years ago was valid and we still have the data, we can still make the same judgments about it. That the evidence is no weaker for the passage of time. And the only account that makes sense of the data about the empty tomb and of their experience is the Christian understanding that Christ was raised from the dead and appeared to them. I see the resurrection as another of those God things, who, God saying, this is big stuff. You need to take notice of this. And I as a, have a responsibility as an individual living in the 21st century to say that that happened all those years ago is still significant for me. It's God getting my attention and saying, what are you going to do about it?